years of uh-huh. diving. Yeah. yeah, you can talk to them about that. And he's going down under and looking at amazing things, some of which appear behind us. This is a montage of images that Dale has taken in his dives in truly extraordinary places that take us into another environment where there is extreme life. Darlene Lim explores lakes in Canada that have amazing things growing in the bottoms of them. And um, she's done a lot of really interesting work, again, on odd and unusual forms of life growing in unusual circumstances. And finally, Pascal Lee, down there at the end of the table, is um, a person who doesn't much dive on Devon Island because it's pretty dry. It's one of the best analogs for Mars on Earth. And so, like Mars, there's not a lot of lakes lying around. There's a few polar bears. I guess you always have to carry a 30-06 with you, but um, it's a great place to go and look to understand the geology and the terrain of Mars by going to a place that's quite similar. I'd like to make one more note about Pascal Lee. He's starting a project called Mars on Earth, and he wants to engage the broad public and even the world in understanding how to build and understand, or how to build a program that will help us really understand Mars. He was at the SETI Institute booth this morning at 10.30 talking about this project because he wishes to engage the truly adventuresome in that. So if you think you want to get involved with Pascal and all the great things he does up at the Houghton Meteor Crater, a place where a meteor did hit the Earth. Um, Talk to Pascal after this. All of these people are, in my mind, adventure scientists. And so I'd like to turn over the microphone to them and have each of them talk for, you know, five minutes or so about what motivates them to spend their career and their lives exploring extreme environments for life and what kinds of things that tells us. And then we'll kind of go back around again and you can comment on each other. And after about 30 minutes, we'll open up the floor for questions. Here we go. Natalie. All right, I think I'm going to start with the basics and just uh, to, to talk about what do we call extremophiles. And uh, extremophiles is really with respect to us. Uh, when we go to places that uh, receive high UV or in places that uh, uh, you have boiling waters or it's really cold or it's really hot or really acidic, uh, these places are nasty for us, but the microorganisms that live there, uh, I'm not saying that they are happy there, but they thrive in this kind of environment, they reproduce and they stay there, so it might not be so bad for themselves. So we have to keep in mind that extreme of fire is, is with respect to us, but uh, the reason what motivates me is just, you know, look at the budget of NASA right now. It's not tomorrow that I can get a rocket to get me to Mars. So uh, short of being able to go to Mars right now, I have to, play, to find places on Earth that look like Mars or periods of time on Mars uh, that I'm interested in. And that means that early in the history of Mars when uh, the conditions were uh, more similar to, to those of Earth uh, right now. And also, um, when you go to those places, especially in the, in the high Andes, when we're going close to 20,000 uh, feet in elevation, you are going back on time. Uh, as you go high on Earth, you are going back in time on Mars just because the air is getting thinner, the temperature is getting cooler, and because the air is thinner, you have this huge variation in temperature that are pretty much equivalent to what you have on Mars. And because we are climbing volcanoes, we have this volcanic environment that is very similar to Mars. So this is a great place, really. Uh, And there is a scientific motivation uh, to understand what was going on 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 Mars at the time. We we know that there were lakes on Mars. That was the first thing that motivated me to to go and uh, study lakes uh, um, on Earth, and probably uh, you two, Dale and and, and Darlene, uh, the same thing. Um, but w- when you, you, you get to the point to say, okay, we have the, the evidence that lakes are there on, on Mars, then what happened to life if it was there when climate changed on Mars 3.5 billion years ago? What, you know, how much time, how did it happen? Uh, was, was there any enough time for life to 
migrate from one environment to the next. It, it is obvious, unless life is very, very different on Mars than the life we know here on Earth, that surface conditions on Mars are not viable for life as we know it today. Uh, so there was a point where either the surface life on Mars completely disappeared and what's left, if there is anything there is uh, in the subsurface, or maybe some species at the surface had the time to migrate. And by, by going to those places that we call analogs uh, on Earth, we are learning all of that. We're, we are learning what type of microorganism survive, the type uh, of environment that Mars experienced way back uh, then, and also, even more importantly for us, how to recognize them, how to recognize their signature. Um, so th there will be uh, a, a sign of the activity of these mi microorganisms. They are going to be uh, interacting with their environment. And through their cycles of life and death, they are going to leave chemical and mineralogical signatures that you are, you are learning to recognize. So this is one of the uh, primarily, uh, primary uh, motivation uh, for me. Um, the other one is something that came uh, 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 after a few years, but I, I'm a little slow. So I started with a Mars motivation, really, and going really high on these mountains and looking at this lake changing year after year and trying to figure out, yes, sure, this is a good equivalent to, to, to Mars. And after two or three years, I say, yeah, but it's also what's happening right here and right now on our own planet. And so all of a sudden, it became... Uh, more important in my mind uh, that going to explore to understand other planets also makes us aware a lot you know, faster of what's going on on our own planet. And, and this is where planetary exploration loops back and helps uh, us look at what is going on here and now and maybe trying to find solutions. At the same time that we are looking for exploration on Mars, we are looking also at maybe finding solution to what was going on and just understand it. And maybe if we don't have the answer, at least learn how to ask the right question about our own environment. So these are uh, two scientific motivations. There are others but uh, there are other uh, uh, panelists here, so Dale. That actually kind of sums up my talk as well. <laughs> um, I mean, what motivates me is exactly the same thing. You know, we want to go back and take a trip, a trip that transcends time and distance. So when I go to the Antarctic or when I go to the high Arctic uh, to look at the, the lakes that I look at in the Antarctic or the, the, the springs that I see in, in the Arctic, um, it's literally taken us back in time to look at Earth's earliest biosphere. Um, matter of fact, here, if you look at the bottom of the screen, uh, right down in here, uh, what we did was we went into a lake in the mountains of Queen Maud Land. So if you went straight south of Africa and hit the Antarctic continent and then took a skidoo, which is what we do, and skidoo in about 120 kilometers or so into the mountains, set up a camp for a couple of months, make a, a hole through the ice of the lake, which is thicker than this ice, or the, the room is thick, um, when we dove down into these, these lakes, uh, it really was like a time tunnel. And this is one of the few places on the planet where you can go and these microbial communities exist. Um, and they're growing in ways that they did three and a half billion years ago. Um, and so that's, that's the, the lesson that we take from there is um, when th we had life on this planet and it was really working quite well, we know that there was liquid water on the surface of Mars. And Mars may have always been cold. It may never have been much warmer than the McMurdo Dry Valleys or other places that we look at in the Arctic or the Antarctic. And so similar environments may have been ice covered like this. So if we can understand what's going on in these lakes um, here on Earth, it helps us interpret the fossil record that we see, for example, in Australia. Um, Ashley, can you just shoot one more slide? Or actually uh -huh. one more? Uh, so what I want to show you here is, is actually a comparison. So on the left-hand side of the screen, in the top, you can actually see uh, some samples of rocks that I, I looked at in Australia last summer. And these are from um, the Pilbara, Pilbara region in uh, Western Australia, the Australia Pool Formation. And this is three and a half billion year old um, evidence of life on our planet. And they're forming these cones. And you can even see in this, this bottom layer here, there actually is a three-dimensional cone that was solidified in the rock record. And if you compare it to the cone that's over on the right in the previous image, you see that they're extremely similar. And as far as we know, Lake Untersea um, in Queen Maudland is the only location on the planet uh, 
that we have these large conical stromatolites that are forming like this. We don't know why. It's a puzzle. And it's going to keep us uh, occupied for probably a few more years to even come close to understanding that. Uh, but it's a very, very different environment. Um, and one I just thoroughly love to, to play in, that's for sure, because it is a journey. You know, we, we have a small group of people that go out there. We have to work for uh, um, two months together, usually six people. Uh, could you go back one slide mm -hmm. uh, for me? And it's a very severe environment just for us as well. So it's an extreme environment in two ways. Um, it's an extreme <coughs> environment for the organisms that can make a living there. Once they get there and they habituate the place they're at, they're okay. Uh, but they have to get there. And like our trip, it's a very difficult one. And we can experience really hard times on the surface. You know, it's, it's an extremely windy place. As you can see in the, the upper shot there, um, that was one of our not-so-bad storms. <laughs> Uh, sometimes we hit winds of 110 <coughs> miles an hour while we're at the camp. Um, sometimes our tents explode. Um, but that's the kind of thing that we just have to deal with once we're there. Uh, so that's what attracts me to this work. So the thing that compels me to do this work is two things, really. It's, the, it's, answering the, it's, it's asking the questions, the scientific questions that we're interested in and trying to look for those answers. But there's a, another toolbox that I've got to go to, another whole set of experiences that I've got to make to... Uh, make this happen. So I have to educate myself how to go into these environments and, and learn to work there. Uh, so it's, it's like getting a separate education. And I've been doing this off and on now for 34 years. I've probably got about six or seven years in a tent in the Antarctic in various places or the Arctic. Um, I've circumnavigated half the continent by icebreaker. In fact, I met my wife on a Soviet icebreaker. Um, and you end up making friendships that last uh, for years and years and years. I'm working with some of the same Russians on this project right now that I've worked with 20 years ago. Um, so there's lots of elements to this that make the, the story compelling and keeps me involved. And uh, that's just what I want to do. I just want to keep, keep working like this and keep asking those questions and looking for the answers. Brilliant. Okay. Let me just scroll through here. There you go. Um, ditto, completely ditto in that... Uh, I feel very fortunate when I wake up in the morning because I get to do exactly what I want to do. And uh, I'm happiest by the water as well, um, especially lakes. My last name happens to be Lim, and so Limnology is the study of freshwater systems. It was just like too easy. Um, but um, I have been working in what a lot of people consider hostile or extreme environments uh, in different deserts, cold deserts up in the Arctic. That's where I met many of the people here. Um, and uh, also un in underwater environments, which is where I do a lot of my field work. But um, actually, my scientific interest is actually looking at um, organisms doing seemingly extreme things, building um, uh, biominerals, uh, in you know, and constructing very large-scale items in what are generally, you know, concern or for all intents and purposes, um, we can describe as as non-extreme environments. But I think as you know, my role here on this panel is to also speak um, greatly to what, what Dale was speaking to, which is the fact that my interest, uh, you know, in, in going into these field settings has actually grown and evolved, and I'm able to tap into my, you know, love of human exploration. And so, for me, sitting on this panel, looking at life in extreme environments, I think what I'd love to speak to you about just for a few minutes is just putting human life into extreme environments, and the preparations required to actually do that in a way which enables us to efficiently conduct our science. And this, you know, for many field scientists, those that are sitting here, everybody's been doing field work for years. Um, there's so much planning that goes into a trip, even if it's for 10 days, uh, especially into the environments that we go into. And we do that, it's kind of second nature. You're trained to do that as a monkey when you're an undergraduate assistant and you just kind of learn and learn and learn and there's so much involved in it. But what I'm interested in is beyond that as well, is what else can we concern ourselves with, with and what else do we need to concern ourselves with to enable us to do science on other planets in a way which is efficient, which is productive, and most importantly, two things, safe and also protective of the environment in which we're studying. Because it's useless, um, as I brought up last night, who was there, you know, for anyone that was there, if the scientists are not safe, if they die, then they're not really useful. And the other thing is, you know, what you want to actually product, protect and preserve the environment in which we're studying. So um, one of the projects that I've been working on is actually in two Canadian lakes up in Canada um, that harbor uh, these large-scale rocks that you see in the bottom called microbialites. They're built, um, the rocks built by some sort of microbial interaction with their environment. Um, but the work that we do, we do from the surface, we do with divers. Dale has dove with us many times. He's an amazing, amazing diver. 
Um, and we were very fortunate to get some funding to put single person submersibles in this lake setting as well. We use the subs that you see in the middle panel there to actually um, map these, uh, these lakes extensively. Their deep lakes are also quite large. The largest one we deal with is six kilometers in length. And um, so for the mapping that we wanted to do, we had to go through a series of decision-making points to figure out what was the best tool that we could use to actually accomplish the scientific goals that we had. Now, as a consequence of that, um, we realized that very seamlessly we have this perfect analog, as Natalie was, was uh, speaking about earlier, to any hostile environment you could imagine, particularly space. And since we're at SETI, and, and I sit at NASA actually, uh, and NASA Ames, I mean, it just kind of made sense. It would, it would have been ridiculous to kind of pass up this opportunity. So we use autonomous underwater vehicles, um, which is the torpedo-like thing that you see up in the top uh, there with the diver. And uh, we use that to collect long-range uh, remote sensing data, which we use as sort of an analogy in terms of mission planning when it comes to, to accessing remote data from different planetary systems with, uh, with orbiting systems with satellites. We also have divers. That's actually a, a photograph of Dale, which I found out Dale doesn't actually like, but I think is beautiful. <laughs> Um, and, you know, and that's actually, the other astronaut that you see there is actually one of the participants that has been with our program with the Pavilion Lake Research Project for years. And that's him out on, a, on an EVA, an extravehicular activity, and, and very similar in terms of many of the constraints, the limited life support that you're dealing with, and all of the tasks that you have to do while also trying to stay alive. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's that whole rub your tummy and pat your head thing, but in orders of magnitude, like, tricked out. Um, and then at the bottom, you have the beautiful single-person submersibles, um, which are incredible to, to fly, which enable us to sit in a very comfortable one-atmosphere environment and do our work underwater, in our case, 200 feet down with cookies and our water beside us. And suddenly, you know, you go from Dale, who's when we're, when we're down at, uh, when he's down at like 100 feet and the lakes are up at 2,800 feet, it, to avoid going into decompression diving, he can only be down there for about 40, 45 minutes. He breathes really slow, um, so he really extends that. But for people like me who are like, oh my God, you know, this is really, this is trying. Uh, it, I, I'm not down there as long. So I have to be very focused and, and um, very pointed in what I do. But if I'm on land, the beauty of doing field research on land is you can look around. You get context for, to the outcrop, for example, that you're trying to characterize. Very difficult to do when you're in an underwater setting. So these deep workers enable us to actually sit there and take a look around and cogitate on the environment in which we're studying. Much the same way as you see the, that's called a space exploration vehicle on the bottom section there that's roving around in Arizona. And so that's also, that's a pressurized environment which um, has since evolved into something which, um, you know, the folks at Johnson, Mike Gernhardt, the astronaut you see there on EVA is actually the PI of that program, is hoping to kind of fly into things like near-Earth objects and conduct science from that platform. So we formed a very nice partnership with our program, with folks at Johnson, with uh, communications engineers at the Kennedy Space Center who are interested in looking at the way that we communicate with each other. They've, they've forced us to simulate 50 second uh, delays, which is fantastically interesting. Um, and all of this is seamlessly integra integrated into our program. And so the reason we're doing this, as I mentioned, is to make us as efficient as possible at conducting science in other um, environments and to develop the tools and the infrastructure necessary to conduct those, that research and, and not to just design the tools and force fit that to the situation. So I want to just tell you, end with a, a quick analog to, or pardon me, anecdote of this story. And um, when I showed Dale this chart, he's like, what the hell is that? <laughs> Which is uh, the perfect proper uh, reaction because what happened is we had mission operators from NASA, NASA Johnson come up and, and uh, one of them called me up and she said, we really want to embed ourselves in your program because we're at the end of shuttle um, and we're moving into, you know, solely supporting ISS, uh, International Space Station operations, but we need to grow. We need to learn how to be mission uh, planners in a different environment and we know that eventually we'll be doing science and that kind of, you know, science operations on other environments, so can we join you? So I was like, Totally. Sounds good. She's funded. Awesome. And um, so she spent an intensive three-day period with us, with her team at NASA Ames. Um, all the scientists came in. We met. She asked us, you know, she really drilled down on us uh, in terms of what are the essentials that we need to plan out. We told them, it, you know, we, they went away and in 36 hours they came back with this. And they're like, look, we've planned out your entire field season. And we're like, great, but we don't get it. <laughs> and we can't use it. And they said, oh. And, uh, 
and they said, well, what do you want? And I was like, look, I got people, especially my program manager, who's out in a million different places at once. And what he needs is a way to just look at his you know, phone and just know where people are, what's going on, if a flight is running late, what does that do to our evening meeting, what does it do to food, what does it do to the science backroom team? So they went away and they made uh, this, which is they took that Gantt chart and simplified it um, into this beautiful design. And this was the, the, the beta version. It's much prettier now. It's called, it was called Score Mobile and now it's called Playbook. Um, and uh, they turned it into a, a system um, an interface which is web-based that we could actually use when we were on site, when we actually had the whole field lit up with Wi-Fi. This has since been turned into an opportunity for other analogs. They're using this now with a program called Resolve, which is an in-situ resource utilization program um, in um, a project in Hawaii. Um, they're also looking at commercial applications of this. And so, you know, I feel a real joy that we were able to give them a real situation to develop a tool which was truly, really helpful to us. Um, and this is the best analog I can, or a, a wonderful anecdote that I can share with you in terms of the stuff that we're trying to do with, with the real science. Um, so looking at the bacteria and look at the humans and seeing how everybody gets along. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry that went on a while. Pascal. <laughs> That's great. Thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm first of all going to tell you a story about uh, little bugs, uh, cyanobacteria. When the Viking landers... Viking 1 and Viking 2 landed on Mars in the 1970s, 1976 and 77. Uh, a cartoon came out following the landing and following the first pictures of the landscape, which showed just rocks. The cartoon showed the Viking landers sitting in a field of rocks. And the caption at the bottom read, uh, don't move, uh, they might think we're just rocks. Okay. <laughs> uh, and the message here is that in extreme environments, uh, life can actually be uh, hidden. Okay. Uh, in the same time frame, the mid-70s, a good scientist called Imri Friedman that Dale Anderson knows and has worked with uh, made a really fascinating discovery in Antarctica. He was in the dry valleys, one of the most driest corners on the planet Earth, and uh, he would pick up sandstones. These are stones that are made of ancient sand that is now essentially cemented into a rock. And if you can imagine that, the grains of sand are actually translucent, so they allow sunlight to come through into the rock. And these sandstones were home, were, were uh, offering shelters to cyanobacteria. So these are tiny little microbes that are essentially mini plants, they photosynthesize. And they're not at the very surface of the rock where they would be too exposed to the elements, but they are hiding in the nooks and crannies of the rock. Not too far in either, because if they were too deep into the rock, they would be cut off of the sunlight. Uh, a bit like caveman or cave woman, they were in this uh, dusky portion of your cave where you have a bit of light from the outside, a bit of the warmth, but still were sheltered from the environment. So in the top millimeter or so of these sandstones, cyanobacteria were colonizing the rock so that if you slice this rock open, you would see this rind of green that would be right beneath the surface of, of the rock. Okay. Sandstones, unfortunately... Uh, are not common rocks in the early history of the Earth. Okay. Uh, in fact, the rocks that you find early in the history of any planet are likely to be granites and gneisses. Okay. Well, granites and gneisses are very different from sandstones. They're very compact. In fact, that's why you use granite as a kitchen countertop. Okay. It's because they don't have a lot of pores. If you pour something onto granite, it won't just seep through your granite slab. Okay. So granites and gneisses are notorious for being very compact rocks. They are nowhere on Earth, usually, host to any cyanobacteria. Okay, they don't have the porosity, and they also have mineral grains that are too dark to let sunlight through. One of our most interesting and intriguing discoveries at, uh, at Houghton Crater was the fact that this impact that created a hole 20 kilometers across 21 million years ago uh, went so deep into the earth, into the earth's crust, that it excavated rocks that were granites and gneisses from the basement of Devon Island. Okay, so rocks that were about a mile deep were brought up to the surface and were completely shattered, uh, if you will, by the impact shock wave that went through the rock. To the point that some of the minerals that were in the original granite and gneisses got vaporized. And in their stead, in, in the exact location of these vaporized minerals, there's now a little cave. 
okay, inside the rock. So the rock itself is quite porous. It's become a sponge, if you will, uh, by rock as rock goes. Well, the point here, the punchline, is that we made this incredible finding, which was all of these shocked gneisses and granites from Houghton Crater are completely colonized by cyanobacteria. Okay. Uh, the vaporization of these dark minerals has all of a sudden allowed light to come through. The uh, disappearance of these minerals has created apartment complexes, if you will, for cyanobacteria to, to lodge themselves in. And we have this really intriguing thing, which is uh, as much as impacts have been bad news for evolved life, like dinosaurs or things that are really uh, not very adaptable, impacts in the case of Houghton have been a boon for, for microbes. Uh, and this brings us back to the early Earth, when uh, the Earth was made mostly of granites and gneisses. It could well be that impacts were actually a, a key factor in creating microbial habitats at the surface of the Earth. They would allow uh, microbes to be sheltered from the UV, uh, have plenty of places to colonize the rocks, uh, and therefore uh, grow uh, when the Earth did not have sandstones yet. So I, I point this out as an example of the type of uh, uh, really uh, interesting, uh, if not insightful, discovery that we are able to make in environments like this. And Dale was alluding to this, I think Natalie as well. Uh, we're, we're learning about the Earth uh, and the early history of the Earth uh, in this process of trying to understand uh, life on Mars and where we might find it. So I would not give up completely on even interpreting the Martian landscape today. Uh, all of these fields of rocks that you see might actually have a cyanobacteria signature, but not visible at the surface. You'd have to crack the rocks open uh, and dig deeper down to, to find them, maybe. Thank you. My boss, Tom Pearson, who deeply regrets not being here, he's in the hospital right now, recovering from surgery, um, calls these guys the Indiana Jones of the SETI Institute because they are explorers and they've told you all kinds of serious reasons why they're explorers, but I think that each of them has a deep passion for being out there in the natural world and making unique discoveries, you know, the conical things on the bottom. I can't remember the name at this time of day. <laughs> stromatolites, I believe. Um, the conical stromatolites, the, thing, the, the, the constructions that you have found in the lakes and the little microbes that mend themselves at the tops of volcanoes and up at Houghton Meteor Crater, what an amazing place. The only thing he ever has to really worry about that he didn't talk about is polar bears. They are the permanent residents. Human beings aren't at that place. So what I'd like to do, we have about, does, do any of you want to make any comments on each other's presentations or shall we throw up on the floor to questions? Let's throw the floor open to questions and we have a nice young lady here, Catherine, who will bring you a microphone. Please put it close to your mouth. Question to Pascal. For the cyanobacteria that you discovered there, is there an implication that they originated there or did they get there from somewhere else? Oh, they, they don't originate there, we don't think. That's a good question. Uh, the cyanobacteria colonize uh, habitats, and so in this case, the the uh, the the rock is being colonized and invaded by them. In fact, we've conducted some experiments where we have set up some uh, cozy traps, if you will, for for them. In other words, um, uh, rock samples that are synthetic as well, but some are natural, like uh, salts where we would just expose them to, to the Arctic environment, let them soak up the, the fluids that are circulating there, snow melt. Uh, and sure enough, after a couple of seasons, they are colonized by cyanobacteria, who are in the nooks and crannies of the salt uh, crystals. So uh, it's, it not only are they, is it a dynamic biological system, but it happens quite rapidly, okay, on a time scale of a season or two. So colonization happens quickly. We don't know how long they survive, though. We don't know how long they've been in the rock. We don't know how, you know, it's, that's a much harder thing to, to measure. A Ashley, can I throw something in on that? So the, the endolus that you find in the McMurdo Dry Valleys, um, when Emory was looking at them, uh, they are, it's a, actually a community. It's not just the sign of bacteria. You've got, it's a, a lichen as well. So you've got fungi and you've got heterotrophic bacteria in there. Um, but one of the comments that Emory said was that these are probably some of the oldest communities on the planet. I mean, these things have been there for tens of thousands of years. So they're growing on geologic time scales and colonizing these rocks. And the, the other point that Emory always made about these communities, at least the Antarctic ones, 
is in terms of an extreme environment, like Natalie was saying, most, most of the environments that we're looking at, the organisms are really highly adapted to these environments. They like it there. You know, it's just that everybody else doesn't like it there, so they're by themselves. The endolists, on the other hand, are right on the verge of death. Um, they, they are inside the stones, as Pascal said, but this is a frozen desert down there. And so the key for their survival is actually water. And water is only available for a few days out of the year. And if they don't get that water, they're toast. Um, so they're, they're actually their growth um, optimum is, is much, much warmer um, temperatures. You know, instead, of, instead of the minus 20 that you get down there, um, it's closer to 15 degrees C. Um, so if, if um, a little snow melt doesn't come in, and trickle down through the pores, uh, they're gone. And then all you're left with is large expanses of dead, dead colonies. And that was the other aspect that Emory was looking at, was looking at these large landscapes of microorganisms with the, which the geologist had walked over for years and years and years. Nobody knew that this was the best place to get a pet rock. Um, <laughs> and uh, he noticed that there was living colonies and then there was lots of areas that had a very slight climatic change. Uh, the snow melt came in too late um, or at the wrong periods of time. So when it came down, it just stayed as a mineral form as ice, and those guys just went away. But they do last for long times. Yep. Next question. What, what improvements in robotic subs would you need so that you could just drop a little sub into one of these lakes and control that from a more comfortable place instead of having to dive in there yourself? Um, well, I'll start it, and then I'll let Darlene say something. So you want to take away the fun, huh? Well, it, it does. Actually, it, it comes down to sort of a panel issue tomorrow um, about humans versus robotic exploration. And I've done it both ways. You know, I've, I took the first um, remotely operated vehicle that was used in Antarctica uh, to explore these lakes in 1986. In fact, Steve Squires, who's operating the Mare Rovers right now, that was actually the very first robotic device he ever used. Um, and we had the opportunity to be using both robotic devices and then going into the water and doing that same work um, with our hands. And we found um, and I think Steve will say this as well, and, and most people that do this work, there's a place for both of them. Uh, so I can go down to 40 meters in these environments. We usually dive pretty conservatively because we're in extremely remote locations, and if we have problems, we're just, it's just too bad. Um, you know, it's, we're, we're several days to maybe a couple of weeks before we could get out, depending on what the weather is and everything. Um, but I can go down for 40, 40 minutes at the most um, to an hour, you know, hour and a half at, at the very most if we're really shallow. Um, but then your hands get cold and you got to come out. And I'm on a line, you know, because we're under the ice. So the only way we can get back to the hole, and it's it actually, if you look up at the lights in the ceiling, um, off in the distance, a lot of times that's what the hole looks like. Um, a little tiny, you know, go for the light. <laughs> um, and we're on lines, you know, typically um, in the lakes, we're always on lines. We have communications and, and we have to use those lines to get back. So in, in addition to a time limitation, now we're on a tether. And we got to drag this tether around wherever we go. Um, and it, it's like being a fish plate, you know, so it does, it does take, take the effort out of it. And I, it, it limits how far I can go out. I can usually go out, usually it's 200 feet. Every once in a while we'll throw on a 300 foot line if we're really interested in going someplace. But you have to keep in mind, if you go out 300 feet and your um, regulator shuts off because it freezes up, can you swim a football field on one breath? Um, and usually the answer is no. <laughs> Um, so that's the risk that we put into that. But with the ROV, or with a manned submersible, um, we can do that. Now the remote locations I go to, we couldn't put a manned submersible into them. It's just too difficult. You know, we've got to go through huge amounts of ice, um, and uh, it's just not practical. Even getting the stuff out there would be hard. But with an ROV or an AUV, you know, we, can, we can put those in crates, basically, that are pretty portable and bring them out, and then we just have to have a generator. And then we can operate those all day long. Um, from the surface inside of a warm tent, and we can go out uh, uh, several hundred meters easily um, and down to the depths of the lake. And that's actually what um, we, we do. We use drop cameras and ROVs to get down to the, you know, the lake I'm working in right now is 170 meters deep at its deep end. Um, the other basin's 100 meters. So the only way we can actually look at that is with cameras. And it's really fun. Yeah, next question. Water as a solvent for the waste of life, but we do nothing. 
Yeah. Well, the, yeah, I was going to say that the, yeah, totally. or, or, even, or even in salt domes um, yeah. in the Gulf of Mexico, um, places where you have oil, natural oil seepages and things like right. that. Um, I mean, fundamentally, all of our life is exactly what we've got. You know, we're all we're all commonly the same life. You know, so there's no different life here on Earth. We're all the same life. Um, it's just a matter of who's exploited it, and is there is an, is, if there's an energy source for life to use, um, they'll take take uh, um, take advantage of it. But I can't think of something that's the equivalent of like uh, a lake on Titan, for example. <clears throat> yep. Uh, your your question brings to mind, uh, however, this uh, uh, this example. For example, there's a microbe called um, Dinococcus radiodurans. It's a weird bug. It the, the name implies that it's, it endures radiation, radiodurans, okay? And it's a, it's a microbe that has, unlike all of us who have uh, normal cells, it has, it has four sets of DNA that are identical. And the whole idea is that it can survive in a high radiation environment for which there are no analogs on the Earth. I mean, there, there's no particular environment on the Earth, naturally, where, that we know where such a feature would be required, okay? And nevertheless, uh, it's, it's able to, to sustain a relatively high radiation uh, and because it has these four sets of DNA. So if one set is damaged, uh, the others kick in and are, that fourth set that's damaged uh, is ignored while it gets repaired based on the model of the other four. So it's, it's an incredible uh, example of a life form that uh, is an extremophile because it could live in a high radiation environment for which there's no analog on the Earth that we could go study, not on the Earth. So where does it live? Deserts. Was it's it actually, deserts? Actually, yeah, the radiation um, part is a, um, a, a result of its adaptation to a dry environment. Is this the same little bug that lives in nuclear power plants? Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's, there's a lot of speculation as to how they, it acquired its, its adaptation, of course. So uh, Dale's right. One of them is the fact that it's, it's from uh, evolution from desiccation. desiccation, from drying up. Yeah. But it's fascinating. Yeah. Another question? Uh, Sherry Van Meter. First of all, I'd like to tell you what happened in the last 30-minute break. We had three teenagers, young, giddy, magpie teenagers, going out the front door. Da -da 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 -da. And one of them was jumping up and down, and they all had on their city name tags. You have a lot to be proud of, if nothing else, for that. You've gotten them confused about the space and what else, what could be out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Well, actually, I did work on a paper um, a few years ago um, that dealt with Lake Bostock. Um, that was a result of some of the work that we've done in the, the Dry Valley Lakes and, and elsewhere. And so basically, Lake Vostok is a, is a lake that's underneath the continental ice. So it's got four kilometers of ice on top of it. And it's liquid because of the, liquid, or because of the uh, latent heat of fusion that's pushed back into the water as ice freezes up. So it's always freezing up at the ice water interface, and it's always... Um, melting a little bit. And so that, that collection of heat can't diffuse out very fast and it stays liquid, so that kind of explains that. One of the interesting phenomena that takes place when water freezes up is um, as, as, um, as you get fern that, that uh, fall, as you get snow that falls onto the, uh, the continent, it traps gas in it. So when, you, when it turns to fern, to ice, it forms little bubbles in it. And eventually those bubbles will um, uh, because there is this cyclic nature, this lake is not completely cut off. It's, it's actually, on time scales of about a million years, it's always turning over the ice above it. And so there's a convection of this ice going down and some of it leaving. 
And so all the stuff that was on the top, eventually about a million years, a half a million years, is going to end up in that lake. And that includes the dissolved gases, um, or the gases that are trapped in that ice. And it pumps, it's just like a bicycle pump pumping up this lake. So one of the effects is that you're going to have all the air group gases that are going to be super saturated. Um, that means that your um, nitrogen levels are going to be very high, uh, argon levels are going to be high, and most importantly here is oxygen levels are going to be very high. And so one of the things that you do when you're sick, if, if you've got trauma and it's infected, you go to a hyperbaric chamber and, and you go to oxygen therapy, and it kills that bacteria. So our prediction is that the, the oxygen levels in this lake are going to be extremely high in the water column. Matter of fact, you form, we, we've shown, we've modeled that you've, you've got uh, the formation of clathrates, methane clathrates and other clathrates on the bottom. But in the water column, you're actually going to have uh, around 500 milligrams of, uh, per liter of oxygen in the water. I mean, it's just huge, huge amounts. And I think that's going to keep uh, um, the microbial action in the water column to a pretty minimal um, um, place. They have actually looked at some of the accretionary ice, some of the ice that has formed from the lake water and stuck up onto the ice above and then it's carried out. So they've drilled down to that before and looked at it and it was very sparse. Matter of fact, there was arguments as to whether or not they actually found bacteria that was from the lake or if it was contaminants coming in. Um, so I think it's going to be boring in the water column. I think the action is going to be down in the sediments and it's all, and of course there's no light that gets down to this lake. You know, you get below about um, 20 meters in, in clear ice and the lights are out. Uh, so this has got four kilometers, the lights are definitely out. So it's going to be all based on uh, chemosynthesis. Um, so um, what, what go, and if there's vents down there, that's a different, sort of a different story, but there's no evidence right now that there's hydrothermal vents of any sort. That'd be kind of cool if it was. Uh, but I think once you get into the sediments and you start getting um, this exchange of electrons, you know, up the electron ladder, um, I think there'll be a lot of things going on in the sediments. So that'll be the, that's going to be where the fun's going to be. So another question. When you look at um, Mars, for example, and you're looking for analogs of extreme files that exist on Earth that don't exist on Mars, the thing that comes to my mind is low pressure. Are there any, any extreme files that have adapted to low pressure environments that you're investigating? We'll get the high altitude lady on that one. Yeah, but e even so, even even going at um, the kind of altitude we are going, which is 20,000 feet, we still have a 480 millibar, uh, and, and that's very, very far from the 6 millibar you, you have on Mars. Um, you, I don't know about the pressure. I, I think that experiments in the, uh, in the space station, for instance, would be closer, uh, something closer to, uh, to space might be more relevant to that. The, the kind of analogy we are looking at at the Hilux is uh, really the UV uh, part uh, of uh, the extreme. Uh, there, yes. Uh, you know that uh, we call uh, a, a high UV index here at sea level when the UV index is 11. Uh, when we are up there, it's between 24 and 29. So this is what I, I, I start to uh, think in terms of really extreme uh, UV environment. And, and UVB is uh, really in the short wavelengths. We are getting really close to things that are under 292 uh, nanometers. So we are, we are really getting close to um, what could have been Mars um, at the very beginning. As far as pressure is concerned, I, this is not a good analog, and I don't think that uh, Unless you are taking something and you're bringing it to uh, much higher in the atmosphere of Earth, you are not going to get any good analogy. I think it's it ISS. Well, uh, sorry, I have to agree with Natalie that, that certainly I, that's actually one great utility about the ISS, and there are other opportunities coming up in terms of CubeSat launches and and a commercial basis as well. I think those are the platforms in which one would want to engage and answer those kinds of questions. Because um, that's going to be, it's going to offer you not only, you know, the environment of space, but in particular the access to the radiation effects as well, which is something which is very important in terms of understanding um, the possibility for life on, on planets like Mars. So. Um, I just wanted to add that there actually have been a, a, a wide range and series of experiments done uh, for microbial life in low pressure. And it turns out that microbes, generally speaking, uh, are actually quite comfortable with very low pressures. The thing is, the, the, uh, the issue really is the fact that at very low pressures, liquid water is now not available in a very wide range of temperatures. And so unless you are in this realm where liquid water is still possible, uh, you are essentially uh, killing life off, not so much because of the pressure itself, but because of the, of the absence of liquid water. 
And to continue on that, Pascal, there are places on Mars we know of, and uh, uh, the models show them, and now the imagery shows that, that we're, we, we know on Mars you will have uh, a liquid of some sort, might be brines, might be water, but uh, something is flowing at the surface of Mars and can uh, today, even today. Yes. Just very quickly, Emory used to say that uh, Crocidiopsis, um, the main alga that you would find in the endolus of the dry valleys, would be just happy if you put it out onto the uh, surface of Mars more or less today and, and brought the temperature and pressure up just a wee bit. Um, you know, so again, as Pascal said, uh, the key here is you have to have organisms that can retain water um, and, and then make it through any other deleterious things like cosmic or um, UV or other forces of radiation. Um, but uh, I don't know. You got anything else you want to say on that? No, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Monsieur Franck. Yes, I'm your colleague, and I dream to ask you this question. So we have the four of you here. Um, We're in trouble. This may occur a trip to Mars in 15 years, 20 years. Uh, are you going? And if yes, do you go? Uh, I'll keep training. Um, 20 years from now, I, I hope I still be in good shape. Um, but yeah, yeah, there is no question in my mind. If I got the opportunity to go, I'll go. I'll go. Well, uh, you know, uh, first I like to have ground truth. I do that all the time when I do science. So you know, I've been, uh, as you know, writing hypotheses and writing papers and things like that. And uh, if I have a chance to go see how many things uh, were stupid and were wrong, and uh, you know. It's better that I figure out myself before being, em being embarrassed, but um, no, more seriously, I think that all of us here, you know, I am not going that to say that we are doing what we do as a surrogate to being on Mars, um, but I would say that we are all driven um, by the same passion of exploration, and we are all driven by uh, this uh, incredible desire of understanding what's around us, what, you know, what the, the solar system is made of, what the universe is made of. Um, and, and also, we, we are very conscious that we are part of a species that need to step off this planet at some point or another, and the soon, in the sooner rather than later. And the best stepping stone for us is literally Mars. It's the closest to home. So if you tell me you have a chance to do that, oh, yeah, of course, yes, I would do that. And if you tell me it's a one-way ticket, I don't mind. I guess I would go in a heartbeat, but I'd have a hard time explaining it to my wife. <coughs> um, but I've, I've probably got about, I mean, I'm the old guy here on the stage. I'm, I'm 56, so 15 years from now, I'm hoping that I'm going to see people on Mars. And I've been waiting for this for the last 30 years. Um, you know, I'm a product of the uh, Mercury, Apollo, and Gemini programs, and, and I'm mad that we're not there now. You know, we should have been there 20 years ago. Um, but yeah, I would, I would go in a heartbeat if I could. Uh, in the meantime, uh, you know, I've got at least another 10, 10 12 years, 15 years of work uh, down south and up north. I would go too, so long as I could come back. I'm not a one-way kind of gal, so. <laughs> um, you wouldn't be alone, we'd be there. <laughs> well, yeah, that's right. <laughs> No, totally. Uh, you know, and that, that's a discussion that comes up a lot. There is a, um, actually, there's a big push out of, the, uh, out of Europe right now that to kind of generating all this energy around going one way and having it all staged. Uh, you know, that's truly immigration. Um, but uh, I, I would go, like I said, if I could come back. And um, if I went, uh, you know, number one thing is I would love to spend a lot of time making sure that I trained up to be um, a wonderful observational field scientist for those people that have spent years upon years looking at remote sensing data, being able to know, uh, I would kick over every single rock I could get my hands on for the very reason that, you know, that uh, Dale was speaking about, because you never know, and, and Pascal too, you never know what's underneath, you never know what's within them. Um, but there are so many other things too that I think if you were to put this question out to the broader uh, planetary sciences community. They would have a bevy of things they, they would want me to do um, first, and uh, you know that's what, a, that's what I, I, I would certainly spend a lot of time training to make sure I did. 
But um, you know, I'm hopeful that within my lifetime we'll certainly see uh, somebody, hopefully a or at least a sample return. Yeah, at least sample return. Or, but, um, but yeah, let's go. Let's Pascal, do it. Pascal, I'm how bored about you? waiting. Uh, I'm actually curious to know who would in this room go on a round trip to Mars. Okay, <laughs> on a one-way trip to Mars. Still a lot of people. Who uh, thinks it's a crazy idea and really would, doesn't want to go? Okay. <laughs> All right, so you are not a representative sampling <laughs> of the population. Uh, uh, you know, we are all extremophiles here. And I, I want to maybe, so of course I would be interested in going. And I, I want to point out that before we get to Mars, as much as I'm driven, uh, like my fr friends here, to see humans walk on Mars and, and you know, go there ourselves, uh, I really think that uh, for a government effort, such as NASA's and for other countries, okay, we really need to make this a very realistic program. Okay? It's, it's a, uh, thinking that somehow it could happen uh, by executive decision one day, like we had the moon landings, okay, is, is really... Uh, gambling that somehow we will have a, a great enemy again in, in, in our near future in history to, to really uh, have a challenge to, to, to beat them at it. Okay? Uh, in, in peacetime, going to Mars is going to be a methodical step-by-step -step process. Okay? That's not to say that a private mission could not achieve that goal much faster. Okay? Elon Musk, for example, believes we can put a human on Mars within the next 12 to 15 years. I believe it, and I'm all in favor of it. Uh, but for a government agency like NASA, uh, I believe in a stepwise approach to getting to Mars. And one of the key steps is to, getting, is to get humans to Mars orbit. Okay, getting to Mars orbit is a lot easier uh, than getting humans to the surface of Mars. Uh, not only easier, a lot cheaper than to get humans to the surface of Mars. You don't need the big landers, you don't need the greenhouse, the spacesuits that are adapted for Martian gravity. You don't need all of the supplies at the surface of Mars. It's deep in the gravitational well, Mars. It's expensive to get to and get out of. Mars orbit is much more affordable to get to. And I think if we focus our, our near-term goal uh, or mid-term goal to getting humans to Mars orbit, that, that will get the ball rolling. And of course, once we're in Mars orbit, you know, uh, having the next steps is being, uh, reaching the Martian surface will be, will, will be very rapid. So what's in Mars orbit that's really interesting? And well, those are the moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos. Uh, and we would not be going to Mars to all the way to Mars just to explore those moons, but they would be a stepping stone in our quest to get to the surface of Mars itself. And so I'm particularly excited by this prospect of getting humans to Mars orbit as our, as our near-term or mid-term goal here, and I really believe in, in, in needing to do this. Uh, who would go to Mars on a three-and-a-half-year journey just to go to Mars orbit and not land in this room? Okay. Welcome. That's great. Right. Um, I'll, I'll preempt the last question, something that I've always loved asking scientists, and I don't think I've ever asked these for this question, is sort of the one-sentence answer to what was it when you were a child set you on the path to become a scientist? For me, my interest in astronomy came out of watching a Perseid meteor shower from an extraordinarily dark place when it was a storm of meteors I couldn't even count. How about you, Natalie? You have to ask my mom, because I don't know. She told me this is the first thing I said. <laughs> I'll ask her the next time I see her. Yeah, I don't have a single eureka moment. I mean, I grew into it. My dad was a, a Navy diver. He took bombs apart. Um, uh, it just, yeah, he was always going off on trips like that to remote places and doing cool work, and I just kind of taken a different path. And science came along, and Cousteau was there to show us the great pictures of everything. Yeah. Um, my parents were immigrants to Canada, and they had to work all the time, and so I was a latchkey kid, so I watched a lot of TV. But luckily, we had Jacques Cousteau, and uh, I didn't have a eureka moment either, but that he was very instrumental in my life. And my parents also really wanted to embrace um, this new nation, uh, this new you know, continent, and so they took us camping all the time. And that was definitely very instrumental in me wanting to be outside and uh, fell in love with the environment. Um, and then, really, like when I was growing up, uh, the, when people would say, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would just say an explorer, but I didn't really know what that meant, but I didn't really want to be anything else, so I feel very fortunate to be in this company here. Uh, to me, that would be Carl Sagan. Uh, before the Cosmos days, actually, uh, he wrote a fantastic book 
uh, called The Cosmic Connection, which I think you should uh, read if you, if you can. It actually has a chapter on Phobos and Deimos, incidentally. Uh, Carl Sagan was just a real inspiration. I read his book, I think, when I was in my early teens. I was interested in science and space before that, but to become a scientist in, in planetary science, that, that was him. Uh, and I was lucky enough to be his, uh, his last TA at uh, Cornell. So take those stories home to your kids and your grandkids and uh, share them. I'd like to thank our panelists. It's been a great panel. And then I